distinguished guests, colleagues, and members of the school, a very warm welcome to a special moment in the life of this school. We welcome to Shrewsbury International Roger Myerson, Professor of Economics at the University of Chicago. His conversation with us this morning is part of the International Peace Foundation's Bridges Project, Dialogues Towards a Culture of Peace. And we are very grateful indeed to its chairman, Mr. Uwe Morowitz, for presenting this opportunity to the school. I said that this is special, for Professor Myerson is, as you are all well aware, a Nobel laureate, having been awarded the Nobel Prize for Economics in 2007. With our houses here at Shrewsbury named after 20th century Nobel Peace laureates, it is indeed an honour to be graced this morning, sir, with your presence. And this is a dialogue, a discussion, an opportunity to question. And at Shrewsbury, we are very proud of our link to our sister school in the UK, where almost to the day, 200 years ago, Charles Darwin was a schoolboy. It is arguable that no one in recent history has generated as much discussion an argument as he. And so, dialogue, you might say, is in the gene pool of the Shrewsbury schools. Professor Myerson will introduce his theme of leadership, democracy, and local government. And then the floor is yours, with Mr. Howard, Head of History, facilitating the question and answer session. And so it is with great pleasure and anticipation that I invite our distinguished guest, Professor Roger Myerson, to share his thoughts with us this morning. Professor Myerson. I'm not sure about uh, giving a talk this afternoon about uh, uh, leadership local local democracy and, uh, uh, and government, I, I, I can say a little bit about what that will be about, but let me begin, just to introduce myself, I should say, uh, to be to be introduced to you as a Nobel laureate is pretty, that, that's very, very nice. I, uh, uh, Nobel Prizes are, are an extraordinary uh, thing, and I want you to know, as somebody who I did some good work and I won a, and I got a trip to Sweden and now I get to stand up in front of you introduced as a Nobel laureate and that is just an incredible privilege and the privilege is, is, is in, in, in being here in a situation such as this. Um, my Nobel Prize was for work on mechanism design is the term that the Swedish Academy used when writing in English uh, and it's not clear exactly what that means but, but uh, I, uh, what, it, what I think it means is we were working on under developing a kind of a calculus, a, a, a mathematical techniques for doing economic, for, for bringing into economic <clears throat> analysis the following problem. When people have different information, they sometimes have difficulty trusting each other. Can you trust what I tell you? Can I trust what you tell me about what, I, what you see, what you, what you know, but I can't observe? Um, economics before 1970 never was able to do anything with um, uh, transactions where people had different information. That was something that was kind of airbrushed out of the picture. Uh, to see how important that is, we're in, we've been, had a series of global banking crises in the last several years. Banking, banks exist because the banks have better information about where, to, where are good investments than the depositors have. If the depositors knew where, 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 where the good investments were, they could invest directly and not, and not have to and, and get higher interest. Um, so banking is, is an example of something that involves people having different information. I was very excited when I was working, when we were making major breakthroughs around 1980, 
uh, on the uh, subject of uh, how to analyze transactions where people have different information, uh, where they have difficulty trusting each other. And I knew it was important. And I knew that some people in the area would, uh, working in the area, would get would get Nobel prizes someday, some decades later. I couldn't know, and it was extraordinary to be one of those who, who, who they chose to, to, to call. As in any human science, I want you to know, Nobel prizes are symbolic of the best in research, and the best in research is always a team effort. I guess what I'd like you to understand, uh, what you, in scholarship, your sense of what is a question that you should want to work on is, is your greatest asset. When I was working on questions that led to, yeah, led to a Nobel Prize in mechanism design, I was so excited about it in the late 70s and early 1980s. Uh, and uh, in the early part of, of the work, I could see people's eyes glazing over. Uh, that, you know, when I talk about the new thing I was working on, you know, I knew it was exciting. What, how do we choose what to work on? It, 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 it comes out of our experience. I want you to know, when I was 12 years old, I read uh, a famous science fiction story by Isaac Asimov, Foundation. It was the Foundation Trilogy. It's a story about, uh, uh, well, the, the mathematical social scientists save the galaxy. That, you'll go, go read it uh, if you haven't already. Um, Paul Krugman won a Nobel Prize two years later and also told the, the press uh, that, that he'd also, as a young, young boy, been inspired in this direction from, uh, uh, from reading that, that sci famous science fiction story. Um, so I have a sense that we, there, there are our world, our, the societies we live in, are good and strong in ways that, that we don't completely understand, but they need to be better and, 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 and safer and, 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 and stronger places to the, for supporting our, our, our prosperity and our, and our, and our security. Um, and that somehow something very fundamental, we need to understand it in a fundamental way. So yeah, to me, when I, when I got a PhD in my 20s, got, got to work as, as, as a young professor, it was just one of the most exciting things I could imagine. I did exactly what I wanted, and, and many of you might not have wanted to spend your life doing little mathematical models of, of fundamental social science. Uh, but um, but if you have something else you'd like to do, uh, I hope you get to do something, some version of it when, 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 when you're finished with your education also. Uh, let me say, besides doing basic work, I, I did basic work on game theory, which is thinking, of, thinking more generally about how to analyze problems of conflict and cooperation. I, when I learned that we didn't know how to, when I realized economists didn't know how to analyze transactions where people had different information, that seemed to me unsupportable. We have to figure this out. And, uh, and I worked obsessively on it for, for a period of five or 10 years and helped to make progress in the field. And now it's, it's something that you can read about in textbooks. It's not all due to me, it's due to many people, but there were many of us working on it. Since then, I've also done game theoretic analysis of, of political processes, different voting systems, how do the different voting systems that you use in different countries, in different democratic countries, change the nature of politics. Uh, and I have more recently been working on models of, since the financial crisis, models of the banking system. Uh, to, because I think uh, the role of the banking system in understanding uh, recessions and, and booms and recessions in, in, in our macro economy has been underestimated for reasons that I mentioned before. The banks themselves involve questions which economists, in John Maynard Keynes's day, for example, or Milton Friedman's, when Milton Friedman was, was coming up with his theory of monetary policy, uh, economists didn't understand how to analyze banks. Since 1980, using the tools of information economics that I was a part of, uh, economists have understood pretty well how to, how to think analytically about the problem of banking. But until 2008, uh, people, economists working in rich countries of America and Europe didn't think we had to worry very much about financial crises. Now I think we're going to bring it together, and, and so this is a time of, of great excitement in economics research. Uh, you are students with many different aspirations. Uh, 
I mostly want to stand before you as somebody who, when I was your age, had a dream of doing something and I got to do it and I get to stand up in front of you and talk about it. Uh, so there's one example. But, uh, but if anybody who's interested in studying economics, I'll tell you we've got a lot more work to do. So anything else I need to say? Or shall I stop and have a dialogue? Yeah. Thank you, Professor Myerson. Um, right, uh, my role here today really is to facilitate this. So if you've got a question, feel free to uh, put your hand up, and then I'll try to get the microphone to you, and hopefully Professor Myerson will be able to respond. If I didn't say anything provocative enough, provocative enough to raise questions, then let me know and I'll, I'll try. Okay, well, unless so you've got any questions. Okay. If you could uh, give the name, your name, please, and then uh, give your question. Um, hello, I'm Kanita Wang. Um, and I'm in Greater Team. Um, and thank you for that introduction. Um, what particularly struck me was when you talked about the different voting systems and the changing nature of that. So can you please elaborate a bit about what you mean by the changing nature of voting systems? Yes, thank you. Actually, now, my, my understanding, I, I may have gotten this wrong, but I think here in Thailand, the National Assembly is elected in two parts. Uh, most of the smart people, I think, are not old enough to vote yet, but, uh, but I hope you talk with your parents about how they vote and encourage them to vote well, and, and, and I hope some people will correct me. I think you, uh, uh, there are most of the seats, I think, I think it's like 300 seats are elected by a single member district, uh, where I think that means there are multiple candidates running nominated by different parties. Everyone votes for one candidate, and the candidate who gets the most votes wins. Um, that's called plurality voting, or first past the post sometimes. Um, the other system, I think there's about 100 seats, if I remember right, which are allocated by proportional representation, where people all over Thailand name one party, and then the seats are allocated to parties in proportion to the, uh, to, is that correct? Is, is that, is that, is that, is that, that much? Um, that's a good system. The, the idea of mixing um, these two different kinds of, uh, of, of seats uh, begins with some writing by Carl Friedrich, uh, who proposed it in the 1930s, 1940s, and it was, it, it was and after World War II, the fundamental law in Germany introduced this in a somewhat different way. Right? Um, uh, but, and by the way, I think the way they do it in Thailand is better than the way they do it in Germany, with all due respect to the Germans in the audience. Um, this, the, 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 the German system is more complicated in a way that we won't discuss. One of the things, what, so one of the things that happens with first past the post, however, there's another variation. This, this is, there's, there's an infinite number of variations on ways to elect people. Uh, in France, in particular, and many countries that, that have been influenced by France, it's been common to have a a runoff that is that we're going to elect one person from our district, but if no candidate gets an absolute majority, then there's a second vote. In the second vote, you might have uh, only the top two candidates running. In France, actually, they allow other candidates to run as well, as long as they get some minimum number of votes. But in the second round, whoever gets the most votes will win. That second round allows a little more focus on more parties. One of the things that happens in the United States, and I think happens in Thailand and in England, is when you have first past the post, uh, in any one district, voters need to learn to, to get themselves behind two parties. You can have different two parties in other parts of the country, but when there are three parties, you run the risk that you might have 60% of the voters who strongly prefer one side, we'll call the left. That's my left. One side for the left, and then uh, maybe 40% for the right, but if there's one party on the right and two parties splitting the vote on the, on the left, you end up getting a right a rightist representative in a district where uh, a majority of the voters are, say, leftists, would have preferred the leftists. So they need to, um, so we learn to start uh, economizing on parties, to make sure we don't allow ourselves to get confused about too many parties. Let me say something, I want to say something important about history in India. In India, has the, it's the same system, the first past the post, that is used for most of, the, I believe, most of the seats here in the Thai Parliament, and is used for all of the seats in the United States and in, in Britain. Um, the Congress Party dominated Indian politics completely for the first uh, independence in 1947 until the 1970s. They got, in the 1950s and 1960s, the, the Congress Party, 
won, I think, like 70% of the seats. They never once got a majority of the votes. The reason that they, they were able to get the overwhelming majority of the Thai parliament, of the, Thai, of the Indian parliament in those years, was that the, the opposition to the Congress party uh, that was founded by Gandhi and Nehru, uh, and Indira Gandhi led it in the 19, late 1960s, the opposition was split into many different parties. And so the, the opponents of the Congress party had many, you know, they, they, they wasted their votes by voting for many different parties. In the late 1960s, leaders of these other parties began to get together and negotiate. They would say, let's agree, in that district, only you get to, I'll, I'll tell, I'll, I'll, my people will tell our voters to vote for your candidate, and in this other place, you'll tell your voters to vote for my candidate. And then it became a genuine competitive system in India. Now let me say something that's shocking to me. In any other field, of, that, of, of, of in any other marketplace, if you have a bunch of suppliers who are getting together and agreeing, I won't try to sell in this district, and you won't try to sell in that district, that's called monopolization. It's called restraint of trade. You, in, in the United States, you would want to call in uh, the various regulatory agencies to prosecute these people for negotiating a restraint of trade. In democracy, it's just considered what you need to have responsible politics. So that comes from the very nature of the system. Now, proportional representation makes it easier for people to vote how they want. If there are two parties that are appealing to similar groups of voters under proportional representation, and we get confused, I vote for the party I like better, and I have very similar political opinions, but you vote for the other one. Well, the total number of seats those two parties are going to get doesn't matter if they split because of the proportionality. So the proportional seats give us, give, give I believe in Thai politics, more opportunities for new parties to get themselves into the National Assembly without voters having to worry about it. Whereas the single member district seats for, force voters to a kind of discipline to say, well, I like these other candidates, but nobody else, I don't think anybody else in my district is going to vote for them, so if I voted for them, I would be wasting my vote. And that makes it hard to, for new po politics to enter. So I think the mixed, but on the other hand, it, it, it imposes a structure on, on our political system. So I think the mixture has some very good properties. I think that I think a lot of countries have adopted it for good reasons. So let me just say, that's a long answer to a very good question. Uh, most importantly, I want to give you a sense that there is uh, a lot of diversity in there. And, and I want to give you a sense that it matters. It, it changes the politics in ways that uh, it's not clear. I shouldn't try to argue any one system is best, although I have, or I could. Um, <laughs> uh, but uh, um, but the, there's a lot of diversity in one should see disadvantages and disadvantages in each. Thank you for this opportunity to be able to speak to you. And can I ask two questions? <laughs> okay, um, following up to Kanita's question, of oh, course, my name is Ming, and I'm um, here yes, today. Following up from um, Kanita's question on the voting system, I would like, because you talk a lot about dem democracy and information asymmetry, um, may I ask you how, sorry, how demo the democracy democratic system of a country could be improved when the majority of uh, voters are um, not as well educated as other countries or are supporting um, radical groups, for example. Um, because this links to about the lack of information or the lack of understanding um, of general knowledge of the, of the democratic system. Thank you. I think the short answer is that uh, there's a lot of literature about uh, uh, what does it take for a country to be ready for democracy. Um, in the world today, I want to give one, one example of a place where a decision has been made, these people are not ready for democracy, uh, where I think that has caused terrible problems. And that is in the, uh, the, the tribal areas of Pakistan, where, where uh, I think for actually for political reasons, military political reasons, uh, I don't, uh, a decision has been made that, that, that to, to continue certain kinds of old colonial throughout most of essentially since the independence of Pakistan uh, there, in the last year there has been some legal change but people still suffer from colonial uh, old colonial 
rules in these, in these territories, and the excuse is the people there are not ready for democracy. Uh, the, people, the, the, group is, the, the ethnic group that dominates there are their Pashtuns. Uh, there are Pashtuns in, in the province of Khyber Pakhtunkhwa province of Pakistan, who have uh, the Wami National Party is, is actually the only, the, was the first, I think, and I think may still be the only party in, uh, in Pakistan to offer its, voter, its, its voters primaries, that is to say, instead of the central leadership choosing who, who, will, be, who will run for uh, members of the National Assembly, the, 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 Wami, the Pashtun Wami National Party off, well, has primaries. So they certainly look like as, as democratic a party as any, and yet their Pashtun cousins who live in the tribal areas are denied uh, uh, the right to control their own local government instead of an old ancient colonial feudal system that's been perpetuated, and uh, that's what allowed the, the, uh, the uh, Taliban and other, other insurgents to dominate the area uh, without uh, uh, opposition from, from, from uh, uh, secular uh, 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 politicians uh, and, uh, and, and, and much suffering in, 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 in Afghanistan and, 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 and in Pakistan and suffering to Americans, American soldiers and other NATO soldiers who have gotten entangled in this war uh, comes from those people tonight. I think, as far as I can tell, all of us get, uh, can be foolish about voting, can get emotional in ways that don't, that, that, that don't take sufficient account of what's good for our country. But the one thing that I can see, as a, so I, I, I think a good assumption, and I, I want to point to the tribal areas of Pakistan where I think a decision has been made against democracy, when really what was going on was, was some, some people in power wanted to create a reserve playground for, uh, for guerrillas who could then destabilize the country across the border. Uh, and we're not really thinking about it. And, and, and the great suffering has come with both to the people of that area and to other people around the world. The one question I would ask is, uh, yes, I would agree with you if there's an illiteracy. If there, when, there, when a country has, has very large adult illiterate population, can they be as well informed and vote? That is a question which I would admit as a good question, and I, but I want to say I don't know the answer. I know that democracy in India, India is a country with, with, with very high uh, literacy rates, and, uh, and democracy in India has survived as imperfectly as any other democracy that the United States is, is uh, that I'm a little embarrassed about some things that have happened in American democracy in recent years. So uh, I, I would prefer, it, until I have very strong evidence the other ways, I would assume that uh, I believe democracy is, is, is probably good for, uh, for, for, for people. The, the people in any part of the world are, uh, unless I have very strong evidence to the, to the contrary, I would want to assume, and, and everything I know in life, which is not enough, uh, makes me believe that people in every society, in every community, are ready to, to have a voice in choosing their leaders. I will talk this afternoon about local democracy. Uh, the importance of devolving a significant shape, the value, let me say, the, the importance and the value of mutual society of allowing municipal and, and provincial level uh, elected councils to have serious responsibilities. I think, as an American who gets to vote in the presidential election, I think presidential elections are more crazy than any other kind of election. I, to elect one person to have a lot of power over a very large nation is, even for a literate person with a PhD, a confusing question. It becomes easier to think about it at the local level. What I will argue this afternoon, however, is that beyond the advantages that it's easier for people to think clearly and, uh, and literate or Ill illiterate, to understand the political questions that are at stake in local elections rather than bigger national elections. I want to argue that local democracy has the possibility to improve national democracy in the long run by giving more politicians a chance to show people, to show us, the citizens of our countries, what they can do with a public budget, how they can spend public money to benefit us, or how they can take public money and steal it for the benefit of their cronies. Uh, when they do the latter, when they steal the money, most, most of it, uh, they don't produce very much, and then we don't, nobody wants to say, let's make that person prime minister. 
So I would believe, this is the question I will raise, I, I know that in, here in Thailand, there has been more, over, from the 1990s till today, there have been increasing, gradually increasing responsibilities to the locally elected provincial councils and, and district councils, but that a lot of the government is still controlled uh, from the central government by, uh, by governors who were appointed by the Ministry of the Interior. I would ask whether, as local councils are given more responsibilities, will there be in the future candidates, more good candidates for prime minister or for leadership at the national level, who people say, this person did a very good job running that difficult province, and now we know that's the kind of leader we'd like for the country overall. So, I'm looking at the relationship between national and local democracy as being one big game. I'm a game theorist, and the game played by politicians, trying to redesign the game so that at the national level, you get more good candidates. You have some, I think, people who support one party or another, I think they see at least one good candidate, but what you'd like to have is two or more political parties offering high quality candidates. I supported the President of the United States for re-election. I thought, I like him, I'd like him to be re-elected. He was re-elected, I'm happy. <laughs> but I have to admit, the Republicans put up against him someone who had run the state of Massachusetts for four years, and who clearly was very well qualified to run the United States government. Um, and uh, that made it a good election. So the quality of, uh, it takes more than one good candidate to make it a real election. You have to, you have to think both candidates could be two or more good candidates. That's when you get competition. Thank you. Thank you. Any more questions? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. My name is Sam. Um, my first question is, uh, in the continent of Africa, what do you feel is the greatest hindrance to economic and political development in countries such as Chad, Nigeria, and Sudan? And more importantly, how can that be design theory and overcoming the basement of information be utilized to develop these countries in these ways? Thank you. Sure. Um, there's a couple that I don't know enough about all of them. Let me say, Nigeria to me is a country I've tried to learn a lot about. It's, it, and uh, it is a country which has gone through the civil war, there's been military rule. Uh, in the late 1990s and early 2000s, it seems that national, that democracy, a, a true federal democracy, seem formalities of federal democracy now seem secure in Nigeria. So there's been a transition to democracy. I'm an American, and Americans' democracy is almost is a sort of a state religion. So it's not surprising that I'm very, I, I favor democracy. I think democracy is a good idea. I think this is, by the way, something that we have in common with the people of Thailand. I think uh, we, may, we may mean somewhat different things by democracy. Our, concept, our, our experience may be different. But Nigeria, so, so, so let's say I have a prejudice, and I think many people here may have a prejudice, that a country should be getting better uh, in, in terms of its delivery of, of public services and in terms of its prosperity, eventually, from democracy, but it might be slow. Nigeria is not a well-governed country. Um, Nigeria, in particular, has a federal democracy. That means there are, I think there are like uh, 50 provinces in Nigeria, and each of them has a governor. Uh, the democracy is very imperfect. There's, a, it, there's, it, there's clear evidence. Everything, I've never been to Nigeria, but everything I've read suggests there's a lot of vote stealing. Uh, but it's genuinely competitive when they run for president of Nigeria, because there are different governors who belong to different parties, and in each of their provinces, they'll steal votes for uh, each candidate. So we, in the last presidential election, whenever that was, uh, it's believed that, that both candidates had many votes stolen for them, but in different parts of the country. This is not good democracy. We need politicians to be committing themselves to honor the forms of democracy. But I spoke about uh, a hope that federal democracy would, would lead to a new, new and better leadership. I've never been to Nigeria, but I have made a series, if you mentioned it, I have made a serious attempt to study its politics, uh, reading books and articles about it, uh, without being a specialist. And even I know there, the names of a couple of governors, uh, names of provinces, a couple of governors, who people say this governor did a lot of good in fighting corruption. 
And sure enough, for both of the governors I'm thinking about, um, there has been talk about them running for, for president of the country. So notice I'm saying that the opportun opportunity to show that you can be better than all those other corrupt politicians can actually be profitable once you have democracy at two levels. However, for each of them, um, I have read, oh, but that governor comes from the wrong tribe. And there's a lot of suspicion. So when, when you have, Nigeria is a country that also famously has the curse of oil money, that, that, that there's oil money that is, is, is spread as bribes that doesn't depend on um, providing good government, it just depends on controlling the oil wells. Uh, but the ethnic envy, a, 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 a system where a country is broken up into different tribes, each of which is convinced that if the other tribe gets to control the presidency, uh, that all the, all the benefits of government are going to be concentrated on that tribe. Uh, the Nigerians now have a very strong norm that presidents are going to alternate between the north and the south uh, and, and, and switch among the various tribes in those regions. That interferes with, with, with the kind of federal, the benefits of federal democracy that, I, that I've been hoping for. So it looks like a counterexample. A, a country in Africa that I think is very interesting but don't know enough about is Uganda. Uganda has a strongman president, uh, Museveni, I forgot what his first name is. Um, uh, he seems to be in the business of being president for life, but he seems to, he is very serious about devolving real powers to, 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 to local and, and, and regional councils that, that have genuine competitive elections. So I'm hopeful that someday, uh, after Museveni retires, uh, people will say that he created a, a structure of a very strong democratic system in Uganda. Uh, in some sense, I would hold him up. What I know, he looks like he might be an ideal autocrat who is genuinely creating uh, democracy. But I think, um, I said one other thing about Africa. Um, trying to remember the name. Will Reno, Will Reno, who teaches at Northwestern University down the road for has written a very good book about, um, about Sierra Leone, about the, the, the descent into chaos in Sierra Leone. And I think the story that he tells, Sierra Leone was a former British colony. He says that under British colonialism, the British managed to maintain control of this country by doing deals with certain traditional local chiefs. When the country was set up, they, they had formalities of democratic rule, but the president of the country was doing, continued to do business with with these local chiefs as opposed to with locally elected groups. So the whole, all the power was a negotiation between a president who's trying to centralize everything. And the one thing he doesn't want, he tells a story about um, one minister under one of the early presidents who was, was doing too good a job of administering the funds to, to actually provide some benefits, whether he was controlling this group building roads or schools or hospitals. He was actually doing it as, as, a minister, as a minister of the national government, and thereby getting a reputation for being um, too good at providing government, and therefore the president got rid of it. Um, you don't want to miss this. this a person who was appointed by the president, but then was getting his own good reputation. Well, but, so when I see processes like that, I think, I believe, much of the suffering of Africa has been political. I'll say one other thing, which is there, there have been arguments. There's a good book by uh, Paul Collier. It's called The Bottom Billion. I recommend it. Uh, and in Thailand, you can understand when he says the bottom billion, in a world of six or seven, now seven billion people, poverty, which we used to think of as national poverty, which we used to think of as being a phenomenon of, 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 of the majority of the world compared to Europe and America, the world, we, world poverty is now a problem of about a billion people, about a sixth of the world. Uh, and countries like Thailand, where you still have many very poor areas, have, 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 have enjoyed much economic growth. And, and this, you know, uh, but there is a perception that much of Africa, as your question asks, as, as you suggests, have a problem of national poverty that countries in Asia, such as this country, have learned to climb out of. Uh, we're all trying to discover the secret of that. I think the poverty of Africa is to some extent underestimated. Because the poverty is overestimated. 
because much of, because bad government means that people are constantly trying to hide any income they have from the taxpayers. And there's a suggestion if you look at surveys of how many people own bicycles and how many people own radios uh, in Africa, where you get a different picture of economic growth, which is not quite as as bad. Uh, Africa, statistically, it's the continent of Africa, and things it's a big place, and places differ. But uh, where Asia has enjoyed a, 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 a dramatic rise in, in popular in prosperity over the past uh, past four years or more, um, Africa seems to have been left behind largely, and the difference might not be as bad as it seems. But you're right; it's it's the problem here. The great question is is what makes the, the question you asked is one I've talked too long about it. It's one of the great questions. Uh, your insights in as people of Thailand into what has helped Thailand to grow successfully, and where are, are there areas of Thailand where intense regional poverty still exists? Why has it continued to exist? If you understand that, you understand something very, very important, and I want to know the answer. I want to know everything, there's no one answer, but I want to know everything you have to say about it. Thank you very much. Uh, next question, please. My name is Quinn and I'm expertise. And two questions ago, we briefly touched upon the idea of democracy in the United States. Do you feel that the electoral college system of voting in the United States is a fair representative of democracy, or does this allow candidates to exploit the system in the majority of the key states, or still sometimes only gain 20 to 25% of the national vote? Thank you. I I approach the electoral college as game theorist, so, so you use the word fair, and, that, and it, that's a very fair word to use. It, it, should it be fair? Should my vote count more than yours? Or let's say, I personally live in Illinois, which is a safe, safe uh, state for the, for the president. He came from Illinois. Uh, we love our, na our native son. Um, and, uh, and so where, other, where people in other states were, were getting the benefit of immense numbers of television ads, uh, we weren't getting so many television ads in Illinois. Uh, uh, at some point, we began to think that was an advantage. But you know, you're serious about the, the vote. And, and it, is, it is, of course, mathematically possible. It's never happened this extreme, but it's mathematically possible for a person, to, a candidate, who got a slight majority in uh, in enough states to get to actually slightly less than 25 percent would would be enough if you use the the underpopulated western states of Vermont and and, and Delaware to, uh, to, to to increase. So something. Uh, of the order of 25% of the vote that constitutes a majority in states that have a majority of the, of the electoral college seats, then could win with 75% of the vote going to the other, to, to another candidate, to one other candidate. And that's, of course, the sounds terrible, that it hasn't happened. Uh, but as a, as a game theorist, I want to look at it and say, how has it changed the nature of politics? Uh, the most important thing it has done is, is, is it's given presidential candidates an incentive to spend a lot of time making promises in those pivotal states. That seems unfair, but it actually, I, I have to say, it, it has some advantage also, because um, if we didn't have the Electoral College, it would be possible for a person, a direct presidential election, uh, it becomes possible, of course, to win by, every vote counts just as much, and um, our candidates might spend more time campaigning in the regions where they are already very strong. That can create regional, that, that can create big, bigger regional differences. When, when, the, when the candidates are spending their time camp, campaigning for the voters in the pivotals in the states that are the swing states, the states that can go either way, they are campaigning for states that are not, let's, let me call them the North and the South. We had a civil war in the United States 120 years ago, and, uh, and to some extent, the political map still looks like that border. Uh, we, we hope not to have any civil wars, but to live together as, as one big country. But if we had one president who was running only for the votes in the South, hoping to get a, a large South to elect him, and uh, one candidate running only in, quote, the North, uh, we, and making promises only to Northern voters, uh, we could have some dangerous separatism. So the, the idea that we'd like to get both political parties operating in all parts of the country. The fact that we have, in every state, state government that's important means that although my, my, my state of Illinois tends to vote Democrat at the national level, 
uh, when people get sick of the corruption of the Democratic Party in Illinois, they vote for Republicans. Even though we tend not to favor the Republican ideology, the Republican Party is alive and very well in the state of Illinois. So that helps also. But so one thing I want to say about the Electoral College is it might help to help keep our country together. The worst thing about the Electoral College, I think, I think the United States has suffered for the Electoral College, but most Americans, I think, don't even know what happened. Around, the, we had a civil war uh, in 1860 to 1865. At the end of the Civil War, the, the African American slaves in the South were freed. The Republican Party uh, took the cause of civil rights for the, for the, for the, for the freed slaves um, and worked very hard to, to reconstruct the South and create. Uh, after 1872, there was a reduction in the amount of, of, uh, of the federal government's control over the southern states, and white racists regained control of those states. But the federal government continued to intervene from 1872 until about 1890 to try to protect the rights of, of, of black Americans in the South to vote. In the late 1880s, the Republican Party realized that because our Senate was on a winner-take-all basis by state, and because the Electoral College was on a winner-take-all basis by state, millions of African American votes in the South were really not benefiting the Republican Party at all. There were a couple of Republican congressmen, I think, from, from North Carolina from the South. But besides that, the mathematics of our electoral college meant that million of the African Americans were always going to be a minority of voters in um, in the South. As long as it was then the Republican Party that was defending the, the African Americans. In the, in, the, in the 20th century, it was the Democratic Party that took the leadership in, in, uh, in, in helping get blacks the right to vote. But in the, in the 19th century, in 1880s, 1870s, it was the Republican Party, and the, and the Democratic Party was the party of white racism. Um, when the Republican Party realized, the leaders of the Republican Party realized that millions of African American votes were never going to make a difference in any presidential election or any Senate election. And as long as the Republicans were supporting the African American voters, the, the white majorities in each of these states were always going to vote for the Democratic Party. They just gave up. I think if we had not had an electoral college in the United States, so that every vote counts, Republicans would have known there would be there'd be a chance of there being a vote for president of the United States where the Democrat and Republican candidates were within a million votes, let's say, and then two or three million African American votes that are loyally voting Republican in the South would have made a difference. Um, so that is an example of where the politicians got an incentive that depended on the rules of the game in a subtle way that you couldn't have predicted when the constitutional rules were being written in 1789. Uh, and I think it is, it is a terrible thing. It meant that the African Americans were not didn't, didn't vote until uh, uh, civil rights reform in the 1960s, uh, 80 years later. So, um, so I, I guess I'm again. Get, I'll say one other thing. There is a there's a movement I just learned about. A friend of mine is involved with this that has had state governments that is asking state governments in the United States to pass laws which say, in this state, if this state will be committed to ordering its electors to vote for whichever candidate gets a majority of the votes nationally, if such laws, such a law, if this law has been passed separately in enough states of the union to constitute a majority of the electoral college. When enough states pass that law, if it's found constitutional, we will have then ended the Electoral College without a constitutional amendment, just simply by state law. Um, that's a, it's, a, it's an interesting trick. I, I don't know whether it will work. Uh, I understand they have a lot of states that have passed it. Uh, and I think that would change the nature of politics in ways that will probably make, I agree, a fairer and better politics. But there is, is a possible downside that I worry about. Thank you. Hello, my name is Al. Thank you for this opportunity to ask you a question. I would like to ask uh, about game theory, as that is the basis of the work, and how does it work, and if it is applicable to the world outside the realms of politics? Game theory is a branch of applied mathematics that um, uh, 
is an important part of economic theory and economic analysis today. Um, it is a technique for analyzing a, a game model. I can tell you, let me, let me say, first of all, I have a book on game theory, but my book on game theory is very, is, is, is written for, I'd say, uh, advanced grad, graduate uh, course. When I teach game theory uh, to undergraduates uh, 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 who are just a few years older than you at, uh, at, at the University of Chicago, I teach out of Martin Osborne's book. So I just first of all mention, if you're interested in the book on game theory, I like Martin Osborne's book. Uh, uh, and uh, I'll give you one of the first things I do when I, when I give some examples of a story, and then I give a general mathematical definition of a game. The general math, I'll say the mathematical definition, which is the most common form of a game is to, to define a game. First of all, I have to tell you who are the players. So I colorfully usually name them players one and two, um, <laughs> whatever. I should say when I, when I teach game here, I, I, I'm in the habit now of thinking of when I, when I give players names and simple numbers, uh, to me, um, uh, odd numbers are, are masculine names, and, and, and even numbers are feminine names. But uh, uh, be that as it may. Um, so first I have to tell you who are the players. Um, secondly, so there's a set of players. For each player, I have to tell you what their strategic options are. So you can really find out many options. You can choose to go left or go right. Uh, uh, there, say there are two players, Mr. One and Ms. Two. Uh, each player can decide whether to go left or to go right. So there's, they can both go left, they can both go right. One, he could go left, she could go right, and vice versa. So there are four possible outcomes. So for each of the combinations of what their strategic choices are, we need for each player a number that represents that player's payoff. And that, that's a lot of mathematical stuff, but that's it. Once I have that, I have a well-defined game. Once my students get used to that definition, I go to the blackboard and I, I write down a, a little matrix that shows them what the game is. I say, well, what do we think would happen in this game? And we apply different concepts. Um, Nash equilibrium. Nash's concept of equilibrium is the most important one. John Nash uh, came up with this idea around 1950, just before I was born. Um, his, I should say, there was a popular Hollywood movie, The Beautiful, a Beautiful Mind, that was about his life. And although, and if it's, as in any movie, it has a lot of fiction in it. And in particular, there's a scene in there where they come up with Nash's, where Nat, John Nash is coming up with his great idea of equilibrium, but they get the logic exactly backwards. Uh, <laughs> but it's, it's, it's not, it, they, he says, now we all have to do this, and this, he's in a bar, and, and they, he tells his friends, this is what we have to do, and if he applied Nash equilibrium analysis, they would have done exactly the opposite. But it's not a bad movie, it's still one of the category. Um, but, uh, the, the use of game theory is what you asked about, and the answer is, uh, when I first learned about game theory, I had a teacher who said, uh, who had written a book about game theory in the 1950s, but when I, when I was his student in the 1970s, he was, he'd gone on and said, you know, there's a lot of people don't understand about game theory. Game theorists haven't done it for mm -hmm. This is such a fundamental general framework for talking about conflict between people we have to have a theory of it. And so I was part of a generation that worked very hard and, and, uh, and have a fancy prize to show for it, but, uh, but uh, there were many of us who worked on, on developing the methods of game theory analysis, and now we, we understand a lot more, given a mathematical game, how to analyze it. And sometimes, by the way, it doesn't have necessarily one solution. I greatly, greatly, let me mention another book, Thomas Schelling's Strategy of Conflict. The Nobel, when Thomas Schelling won a Nobel Prize in 2005, the Nobel Committee described him as a game theorist. I have gotten to know him in recent years, and I asked him, are you a game theorist? Do you want to be called a game theorist? He said, no, he does not want to be called a game theorist. So he's not a game theorist, but he, he, in his book, he looks at um, international relations questions and stories of conflict that people might have in many situations of life, and he uses game models. So he, and he not only used game theory, but he transformed game theory, but because the, the questions he asked, some, some techniques of game theory were useful for it, others were not. And the, and the things that were not useful for analyzing, for, for analyzing Thomas Schelling's questions um, have dropped out of game theory. And the things that were useful, in particular, 
I've said this before. He showed when people have different information, their suspicion about each other was something we need to analyze. And the game theory techniques that were good for that were very interesting. Were very, it, become, it became a focus of game theory research thereafter and in my life. I should say, by the way, I'm giving the reference to Thomas Schelling's Strategy of Conflict. It's a book from 1960. The first, I've read the whole book several times in my life, but the first three chapters have the whole thing. Everything else is just elaborating. But reading the first three chapters, you could get a lot out of it. I wrote an appreciation, I'll advertise, I wrote an appreciation of it for its 50th anniversary in 2010 in the Journal of Economic Literature. Look at, if you're interested, you can look at that. Um, actually, let me just say one other thing while I'm tooting my horn. Uh, there, there are two, at least two papers I'd like to mention. One in the Journal of Economic Literature in 1999, which is my telling of the story of, of John Nash's idea of Nash equilibrium, and, uh, and, and the Journal of Economic Literature in 2010, uh, my telling of the, retelling of the story of, of, of what we learned from strategy of conflict, are a good introduction and might be of interest in high school, to high school students. It's short and it's, it's about history, history of the Now, the most important thing I want to say to your question is, what is the model we're analyzing? And the answer is, I don't, you know, if you and I are in, in, in a complicated co transaction, I don't necessarily know the model. So being a famous game theorist doesn't mean that I, I'm going to suddenly see things you don't see. I think, in general, being a game theorist has trained, and when I teach game theory, my students, I hope, begin to appreciate that when you're thinking about conflict between people, you have to look at it from all sides. One of the things that I think people often forget that, that playing with game theory models helps to remind us is, in particular, things that you know other people might not know, your opponents might not know, and you kind of have, and they're uncertain, and their uncertainty about things that you know, it's easy to forget because you're not uncertain about those things. Um, anyway, so looking at it from all, game theory teaches us to look at it from all sides. It's not enough for me to ask, what should I do? I need to also ask, what would I do if I was a different kind of person from who I am? In particular, if I was the kind of person who you shouldn't trust, what would I do? Because I, if I want you to trust me, I'd better do something different from that. Uh, and that suddenly begins to create, introduce costly signals, because maybe I might want to kind of do something costly to prove to you that you can trust me. That involves my recognizing that you're uncertain about whether I'm a trustworthy type of person and, and realizing that I have to somehow change your beliefs. Game theory, when you do this general analysis, you can't miss those questions. It forces you to go through the mathematical the mathematical list of questions, forces you to think about all of that. But I don't know what is the right model. Um, there's a financial crisis, I've said, the bank, understanding the banking system, and I think financial, the regulation of banking systems in, in different countries is really important. It is a game theoretic question. That doesn't mean I, Mr. Famous Game Theorist, am ready to tell you what is the right way to design financial regulations, because we have to know a lot about the details of what the banking business is about to understand what are the real strategies, what are the real payoffs, what are the real uh, what information do people not have that's really important to take into account? The world is too complicated for us to understand. So any model we're going to make will be a simplification. What is the right simplification is, is a huge question. So game theorists have very fundamental techniques. I think it's very exciting to study game theory. But it doesn't suddenly make you the master of the universe when you understand game theory. Because you first have to understand the universe. And since none of us can, but it helps you to maybe ask a little better questions uh, about the universe and in a different way. And, uh, so I recommend it to Schelling's Strategy of Conflict, a lovely introduction to the game theoretic thinking by a man who would rather not be called a game theorist, but has profoundly influenced game theorists like me. And, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and Martin Osborne's textbook is, is a good introduction to the game theory. Thank you. Um, you can go. Hi. My name is Jackie, and I want to ask you, uh, do you think, what do you think is the best solution for the conflict in Thai politics right now? The conflict where? In Thai politics. Okay. The short answer is, I, I knew this is my first week in your country, and I, I'm not an expert on your politics, and I better not pose as such. 
Uh, I understand that, I think, by the way, because, because I understand something of the, of the electoral system, I'm guessing, I understand that there are many parties in, in, in the Thai National Assembly. I'm guessing that most of those single member district seats belong to two main parties, and that the other parties are largely from the proportional representation elections, but there might be some regions where they, they also elect small party representatives. Um, where the, those are. I have the impression that, that people that are very passionate about democracy in this country, that if I mentioned one party, I could find uh, some people, I could find many people somewhere in the country, maybe not anybody, nobody in this room would love that party, and I could find people somewhere in this country, maybe here or maybe somewhere else, who hate that party. Uh, and, uh, and, and that's similar to my country also. Um, I hope democracy in Thailand, I think people are serious about democracy in this country. I think it's something that people value, as opposed to the alternative, which has in living memory is that it involved the leaders of the country being determined by a negotiation among, in which the leaders of the army have a particularly important voice. The idea that in order to be a leader of Thailand, you need to get millions of people to say that they want you to be a leader of Thailand. Millions of ordinary people uh, throughout the country. That's a principle that I think the Thai people appreciate, and I think, it, uh, and I think if, it's, if democracy succeeds as well as I hope it should, then 50 years from now, and 100 years from now, and 500 years from now, in Thai democracy, that people will still feel passionately that, 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 that half the country favors one, other country loves the other party. Uh, but that doesn't mean it can't be improved. Uh, the question I wanted to ask, and then you're, you're and the hypothesis I want to raise is whether with two major parties alternating between power and each one having something which uh, it's supported, having faults, which its supporters tend to overlook and its opponents see very clearly, and we, we might wish, can't we get better candidates from somewhere else? One answer is the, the first pass, the post system that Thailand and America uses tend to force us into a two-party system. But devolving more power to provincial governments, to municipal governments, that gives local leaders more opportunity to show what they can do independently with, 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 with a share of the public budget, can be a way to generate more, better alternatives. Uh, there's a sense that in this, the recent hurricane uh, Sandy that just hit uh, the northeast United States gave um, uh, Governor Christie of, of New Jersey a chance to show himself as being a very good leader in a disaster, which may make him a presidential candidate. Uh, and it might mean that he becomes someone who Democrats and Republicans, he's a Republican, but Democrats and Republicans might say, you know, this is a guy who did a really good job, uh, let's vote for him for president. By the way, the fact that, that he's, he's a Republican in an area that tends to vote nationally democratic comes from, again, this dynamic that even in a region that seems solidly for one party at the national level, uh, when they get frustrated with, the, with, the, with when voters, as that always happens, get frustrated with uh, corruption, they will turn to the other party and give the other party a chance, at least locally, even if it. So the, the question about improving Thai politics, I want to ask the question, are there ways to give more politicians a chance to show their stuff? Freedom of speech is very serious in this country as in America, and anybody can stand up and write fine and fancy things. I hope that I've said things about politics that might make you trust that I would be a good leader. So wouldn't you vote for me for President of the United States? No, you should not, because I have never run any public budget, and for all of my ability to, see, to say nice things about voters' rights and about good government, doesn't mean I have ever done anything, and in fact, I haven't. Um, and the only way you should trust me is if I would first run for my village council in Wilmette, Illinois, where I live, and then perhaps if I could run for office in the state of Illinois and do some good work at that level, then perhaps I could be considered for national leadership. I'm a little too old for that, I've got another job, but, um, but I think that's the, that's the route. And, and, and so I'm asking questions about, about how to get, give more politicians opportunities independently to show what they can do. Um, the, I'll say one other thing, which is the, uh, on that level, which is in a multi-party parliamentary system where you have coalitional government, there is another route because regularly, 
cold, in cold, the coalition governments you've had, the prime minister has given some ministries to, uh, to, to the leaders of, of his coalition partners, or minor parties. I just told you a story about Sierra Leone where the president of the country uh, attacks his own minister because that minister was doing too good a job. But when it's a coalition government, the prime minister can't attack a minister who is actually using the ministerial funds to provide good public services. And that can be a, another vehicle by which a, a politician can begin to demonstrate to the people of this country uh, how good they can be. Now, let me say one other thing, and that is, as you look at the faults of the leaders of both of the major parties, I'm trying to look at them honestly, including the one the, the party that you tend to favor, you should understand that already there is a good dynamic, which is that each of those parties would like to convince you that they're just a little bit better than the other party. That's all they need to win the election as long as, but each a little better, it takes time, but one they hope that that will lead to higher expectations. I think, I think we talk, the world is a big place, and we have different cultures. I love the food in this country, I think it's much better than the food in my country. <laughs> um, I can buy Thai food in my, in my country as well, it's not, it's better here. But those are not, the, qual the good or bad quality of our, of our cuisine is not, is not the most important thing about us, how we dress or, or, or whether we go by our first names or our family names with, is, is, is less important. I think the, the most important part of culture to me is what do we demand of our leaders? What, kind, what, what kinds of things do I, we think qualify a person to be a leader? What kinds of things do we think disqualify a person to be a leader? Uh, the hope is that in, in democracy, people gradually learn to expect more of their leaders, um, to understand that uh, leaders who who give a, give a pro give away money but then leave the country indebted uh, have not necessarily benefited us. Uh, that, uh, that we need to ask not just what do they say, but to 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 allow freedom of the press to reveal uh, whether they are stealing money from the government uh, for their personal benefits. Uh, to, and uh, that expectation, we, have, we only learn when we have good examples of people who do better. Uh, and in that sense, we need, we need many candidates, we need many politicians offering themselves and building reputations. Uh, and it takes time. Uh, uh, thank you. Thank you very much. We have time for one more question. Hi, my name is Cameron. Uh, so, a statistical report showed that one in two college graduates in the U.S. are unemployed. Do you think this problem can be solved by local governments or as a U.S. Uh, government as a whole? It's a good question. You know, we have a you know, huge unemployment in the United States. Uh, it's kind of, we're recovering gradually from a financial crisis. Uh, credit suddenly vanished to small businesses uh, around the end of 2008, early 2009. Uh, it's complicated, and every economist, uh, no economist knows the full answer. Uh, I'll tell you my prejudice, which is I think, uh, first of all, I, I think, I think this, this, this crisis came out of the banking system, and more important than the deficits, there's a theory that goes back to Keynes that the, the, the solution is, um, is, is printing money and spending it. Now, I've spoken praise of local democracy, I, 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 and actually I do have some role in, on a budget commission for the state of Illinois. Uh, the state of Illinois and, 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 and the city of Chicago and the village of Wilmette, where I live, do not have the ability to print money, cannot run deficits. Uh, on the other hand, the central government uh, could run a deficit spending, and, and, but, but, and what should it do with that money to stimulate the economy? Uh, I think it's actually not a bad idea uh, as in Obama's uh, uh, fiscal stimulus in, 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 in 2009, uh, much of the money was taken, with, essentially printed by the federal government, uh, issued debt, but then the debt was bought back by, by the Federal Reserve Bank that has printing presses to print dollar bills and buy the debt. So essentially we printed some money, and much of that money was given by the federal government to the local governments, and then the local governments spent it. And I think that's not a bad idea. Um, but uh, on the other hand, 
we have an enormous deficit in our country and no clarity about how in the long who is going to be taxed in the long run to pay it off. To solve, to make that clear, uh, some hard decisions need to be made. We, that doesn't necessarily mean that taxes need to be raised immediately. Uh, the ideal and American politics is in a bad way. The country is designed to make uh, the president and the Congress uh, have difficulty with each other, and sometimes to be grid, the possibility of gridlock is built into our constitution. As someone who dreams about writing constitutions, I might not like. I might prefer to have a parliamentary system, as in Thailand, uh, where whichever country wins in 2010, the Republicans clearly won a, ma a majority of seats in the National Assembly. And if we were a parliamentary system, the Republicans would have had control of the United States government. I personally then and now and most recently voted for the Democrats, but I think I would have preferred to have the Republicans take over the United States of America in 2010 as they would have under a parliamentary system, having won the election, so that something would get done. What, what, what my best hopes are is that the lame duck Congress, this, uh, this duck that's, that's, that's had its wings clipped that has to wobble around because it's, it's the end of its term, it's a wonderful phrase, the lame duck Congress, um, that is, that is this, this wobbling duck is my greatest hope for, uh, for, for, for decisive. Now we've got politicians in, in the legislature and the President of the United States who are the farthest. The President of the United States is not going to have to be elected. And the, the legislators who are going to stand for re-election are the farthest from those, the dreaded day when they have to pick the voters. So maybe now they can make the hard decisions to in, increase taxes on somebody and to cut some populist programs in, in order to balance the budget. Uh, we, need to do, we need to make those decisions. Uh, but the, who's going to hire? I think uh, reducing uncertainty, the enormous fiscal uncertainty about the United States government spending is one, is one part of the solution. A better financial regulatory reform, uh, that I think most importantly, we need to ask banks to hold more capital, but we need to. There, in, the, in the details of financial regulatory reform are rules that encourage our banks to buy marketable securities rather than making loans to small businesses and, and individuals. I think that needs to be fixed. The marketable securities that they bought, the theory was when they buy marketable securities that it's, that it's safer. In fact, we discovered sometimes it's not safer and when they do that, this blows up the banking system. These, trip, these mortgage backed securities and in Europe reach debt. Uh, where it would have been better if the banks made a well diversified portfolio of loans to small businesses, and that would help to get college graduates more jobs. The one other thing I think we do have an international trade problem, and the foreigners continue to want to hold the United States dollars. Uh, the, the Chinese, for example, continue to run trade surpluses with the United States. That means that the China, when that happens, China is sending goods and wonderful goods and services to the benefit of Americans. And they're taking in exchange back promises of dollar bills, which, and we, we in the United States, we have printing presses, and we can print more of those promises of dollar bills. Perhaps if we had a threat of inflation, we could get foreigners to, be, to stop being so in love with holding dollar bills and wanting to spend those dollar bills on buying good American service. And that would help to create jobs for people in the United States. Uh, it would mean, um, uh, and, and so I think that's, that's my view of how we're going to fight our way out of, the, out, of, out of the recession, an improvement of the banking system, a reduction in the uncertainty about when politicians finally make some hard choices. And, uh, and, uh, and I think a certain amount of inflation that gets people to want to stop, until people stop uh, uh, hoarding dollar bills and, and they can spend a little, spend them a little more quickly uh, will help to, uh, until, they, until they get, the, 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 the workforce in our country gets back to work. It's an excellent question. Thank you. Thank you very much. I really appreciate it. Thank you very much. Yeah, the questions have been great. Can I have a round of applause, please? Thank you. And I can only say I'm going to up the stage to uh, present um, a little gift from uh, Troy's with our appreciation for your uh, wonderful talk. Thank you very much.
providing us with this wonderful opportunity to discuss and engage in meaningful conversation. And I'm sure that even after today, we will continue to discuss and address topics amongst ourselves in our community.